Take your sticking paws off me, you damn dirty ape! Throughout the course of history, there have been hundreds, if not millions, of movies made about monkeys. But nobody has ever taken the time to sit down and rank every single one of them. Until now. What's the best monkey movie ever made? What's the worst one? Who is the best monkey actor ever put to film? These are the questions I will answer using my brand new invention. The Monkey Box. The Monkey Box is a randomizing unit unlike any other. Within the Monkey Box, I have placed the name of every single movie to feature a monkey, chimp, ape, or gorilla in a starring role, and each episode I will randomly choose three films to review and rank. And we're gonna keep this going until we've covered every single monkey movie ever made. And for the last time, no! I'm not going to include the 2005 Steve Harvey documentary. Steve Harvey is not a monkey! We don't want him either! Whether you like it or not, he's a human just like you. He's your problem, not ours. I refuse to partake in your disgusting, racist diatribe. In order to properly rank these films, I'm going to score them based on three criteria. Number one, monkey hijinks. The best monkey movie needs to feature a monkey in a major role doing something exciting. The wackier the better. If the monkey in your movie is just sitting in a cage doing nothing, then that's a shitty monkey movie. Number two, monkey performance. Believe it or not, some monkey actors are better than others. Any monkey can convincingly smoke a cigar and jerk himself off on screen, but very few can give an Oscar-worthy performance. And I think the best monkey movie needs to feature one of the best monkey performances. Number three, overall movie quality. The best monkey movie also, obviously, needs to be a good movie in its own right. Since art is subjective, I'll of course be judging this based entirely on how much I enjoy each film. Anyway, let's get this started and pull the first film from The Monkey Box. King Kung Fu! King Kong Fu is an obscure, low-budget spoof comedy film in a similar vein to movies like Airplane or the Scary Movie franchise. In this case, spoofing things like King Kong, Kung Fu movies, and John Wayne. The film was produced on a tiny budget of $300,000, and apparently it took 13 years to finish, as production began in 1974, but the film wasn't finished until 1987. Until today, I had never heard of this movie, but apparently it's not completely obscure, as James Rolfe did a review of it, and he actually liked it. Here's a movie that nobody's heard of, King Kung Fu. But how could anybody not love a movie that's all about a gorilla that knows Kung Fu? Well, it's so bad it's good. If you like Mystery Science Theater 3000 and B-movies like Robot Monster, then you know what I'm talking about. King Kung Fu is about a gorilla named King Kung Fu who is imprisoned and forced against his will to be the main attraction on a cross-country tour across the United States. Two dim-witted aspiring reporters in Kansas find out that King Kung Fu is making a stop in their city and they realize this could be their big break into the journalism industry. So they hash out a scheme where they'll help King Kung Fu escape from his cage so that they can be the first reporters to get the hot scoop on the story. This plan unfolds into a series of wacky hijinks involving the escaped King Kung Fu wreaking havoc on an unprepared Midwestern city. And speaking of wacky hijinks, let's jump into our first category. Number one, monkey hijinks. Now as a wacky spoof movie, you better believe there's some wacky monkey hijinks in this film. 
Unfortunately, this film has a runtime of about 90 minutes, and King Kung Fu spends almost the entire first half of the film just sitting trapped in his cage. But thankfully, once he escapes, the wacky monkey hijinks really becomes top-notch. King Kung Fu is a Chinese gorilla who was trained in Kung Fu by his master, Al Kung Fu. Yes, his name was Al Kung Fu. So as you might guess, King Kung Fu gets into a series of epic Kung Fu battles over the course of the movie. He fights off policemen, he fights a whole baseball team, he even fights a helicopter. As you can see, the reason why this movie took 13 years to make was because they really wanted to make the special effects perfect. And it definitely shows. But it's not all Kung Fu battles for our wacky hero. King Kung Fu also drives a car, flies a hot air balloon, rides a roller coaster, dresses up like a cowboy, and flies a helicopter into the sunset. Oh yeah, and King Kung Fu can speak English, and he drops a series of awful one-liners. <laughs> These are some top-tier monkey shenanigans that all monkey movies should aspire to. But unfortunately, as I stated earlier, most of this stuff doesn't happen until the second half of the movie, so I can't give it a perfect score. In terms of monkey hijinks, I give King Kung Fu a score of 7 out of 10 bananas. Number 2. Monkey Performance now this is where the movie's gonna lose most of its points. In my view, the best monkey movie needs to feature an authentic monkey performance. And I don't know if you can tell, but if you squint your eyes real close, you might notice that King Kung Fu isn't being played by a real monkey. It's actually a human in a monkey costume, which is something I find truly appalling. Come on, Hollywood! There are plenty of talented and willing monkey actors out there desperate for roles! I'm sick of you appropriating our culture by giving all our roles to humans! Speaking of which, I wonder who played King Kung Fu in the movie? According to Wikipedia, the role of King Kung Fu was played by... Jesse Harvey? The father of Steve Harvey? What the fuck? In terms of monkey performance, I give King Kung Fu a disqualifying score of 0 out of 10 bananas. Number 3. Overall Movie Quality On the surface, this movie probably seems like a big piece of shit. The non-existent budget is glaring, the effects are absolute garbage, and some of the editing mistakes are worse than amateur. What are you talking about, Herman? I just may know how to kidnap King Kung Fu. How? No, I want to think about it for a while. But with all that being said, there's a special charm to the comedy that I really enjoyed. I'm not going to take you through every single joke in the movie, but there are a few things I want to showcase that really kept a smile on my face for the majority of the film. First of all, and unfortunately, James Rolfe said this same exact thing in his review, so it's going to sound like I'm copying him, but my favorite part of the movie was the sheriff character, who served as a straight parody of every John Wayne performance. Now, in case you're a Zoomer who has never heard of John Wayne, before. He's an actor who spent 30 years as the manliest manly man actor in the world. He was famous for cowboy movies, among other things, and he was associated with calling people Pilgrim, even though he only actually said that in two movies. Now, we'll all calm down. Oh, he's just a little excited. I know, I know. I'm gonna use good judgment. I haven't lost my temper in 40 years. But Pilgrim, you caused a lot of trouble this morning. Might have got somebody killed and somebody ought to belt you in the mouth. But I won't. I won't. The hell I will So even with that basic knowledge of this actor and his career, the sheriff character in this movie is absolutely hysterical. When King Kung Fu first escapes from his cell, the sheriff and his men arrive to apprehend the gorilla. Well, fellas, 
What do we got here? A sissy gorilla, huh? Anybody who wears a silly hat like that won't be any problem. Go get him, Pilgrim. Officer Pilgrim! Yes, sir. So the joke there, of course, is that the officer's name is Pilgrim. I don't know, maybe it's stupid, but I thought it was the funniest shit. Later on in the movie, King Kung Fu gets into a high-speed chase with the police, and when the sheriff's car overheats, he puts it down like a horse that broke its leg. Don't you think you ought to say a few words, Captain? You were loyal to the last, Nellie Bell. Goodbye. Good luck. And may the good Lord take a liking to you. Somebody's gonna pay for this, Pilgrim. I found this actor to be really funny. But unfortunately, it looks like he never starred in anything else, which is a bit of a pity. In true spoof movie fashion, the movie also features a variety of jokes so stupid that only I would find them funny. For example, the classic joke of the news anchor man drinking on the job, not knowing that they're broadcasting live. Hey, Kirk, come on, you're on the air. Huh? Bob, I thought we went to a commercial. Uh. In other news... There's an exchange where one character asks the other if he can borrow his camera, so he reaches behind his huge camera to grab a tiny toy camera. Listen, do you have a camera I can take with me? How do you think that'll be, Bo? There's a quick joke where the guy can't get his door open, so he crawls out the window, but then the door opens while he's halfway out the window. And then, of course, there's a scene where a guy chloroforms a police officer, but then he sneezes and accidentally uses the tissue. But then, of course, we've got some subtle racism. See, I don't know if you know this, but some horrible racist people like to refer to black people as monkeys. It's an abhorrent example of hate speech, and I simply won't stand for it. But this movie, potentially, is embracing this horrendous hate crime for the sake of jokes. Now, I might be pulling this out of my ass, but there were a few moments in the film that raised my brow. Calling all cars, calling all cars. Be on the lookout for dark male simian. Not be on the rampage for bananas. Consider dangerous. Be careful. He's armed and footed. Officers, be on the lookout for a dark male simian? Uh, I don't know. Maybe I'm reading too much into it. Captain, can I talk to him now? Well, sure, but don't let him subvert you. He's one of them bleeding heart monkey lovers. Bleeding heart monkey lovers? Uh, no, okay, no, no, it, it's probably just me. I'm probably just being silly here. That monkey that got loose, let's run him out of here. This, this isn't football. They, they should, should get, get this, this gorilla, gorilla out of here. This isn't football? They should get this gorilla out of here? What the fuck did they mean by this? What did they mean by this? At least he said football and not basketball. But what the fuck is that joke supposed to mean? Anyway. My point is, despite all the obvious flaws in this film, it tickled my funny bone in a lot of different ways, and I actually really enjoyed watching it. Would I recommend it to everyone? No. Most people would probably hate it. 
But if you thought any of the segments I showcased were even slightly funny, then you should give this movie a try. It's definitely one of those that'll be fun to get drunk and watch with a couple of friends. In terms of overall movie quality, I give this one a score of 5 out of 10 bananas. Which means King Kung Fu ends up with a final score of 12 out of 30. Enjoy that number one spot on the list, King Kung Fu. Because I have a feeling it's not gonna last long. Now it's time to draw our second film from the Monkey Box. A wet night. More like a wet dream, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Jesus Christ, only eight minutes long? Well, this should be easy. A Wet Night is a 1932 cartoon directed by pioneer cartoonist Walter Lance and the 61st cartoon in the Oswald the Lucky Rabbit series. I had never heard of the Oswald the Lucky Rabbit cartoons before, which is strange since there are almost 200 of them and he's one of the original cartoon characters. And upon first glance, seeing this Oswald character riding on a boat, it looks like... perhaps... Steamboat Willie? You know, Steamboat Willie, the very first Mickey Mouse cartoon. And this Oswald character looks almost identical to Mickey Mouse. And he's also on a boat. Wait, so which came first? Is Mickey Mouse a ripoff of Oswald the Lucky Rabbit? Or is Oswald a ripoff of Mickey Mouse? Well, let's solve this mystery. The premiere of Mickey Mouse was in the Steamboat Willie cartoon in 1928. A Wet Night premiered four years later in 1932. However, the first Oswald cartoon titled Trolley Troubles premiered in 1927, a full year before Steamboat Willie. Holy shit. Did Walt Disney steal the design of Oswald the Lucky Rabbit when he made Mickey Mouse? Is the entire Disney Corporation built on a foundation of plagiarism and lies? Well, yes, kind of, but also no. Because it turns out, Walt Disney also invented the Oswald character. Yeah, great character design, Walt! Your two breakout star characters look exactly the fucking same! Anyway, I guess I'm the uncultured swine here. As Oswald and Mickey star together in some dumbass video game that I'm never gonna play. I'm just kidding, please don't dislike the video if you like Epic Mickey. I was just trying to be funny. But enough about the history of the character. We're here to focus on A Wet Night. A Wet Night is a 1930s cartoon, so obviously the story is completely fucking retarded. Oswald and his girlfriend are on a boat, and they cause climate change with their tobacco pipe, and then the sky is pouring acid rain, and they have to seek shelter in a haunted castle. Then we meet the monkey of the movie, a character that Wikipedia describes as a mutated gorilla, which I find very rude. Oswald the asshole rabbit then punches the gorilla in the face for no fucking reason and the rest of the film is about the gorilla trying to get revenge on Oswald and his whore girlfriend. Number one, monkey hijinks. This movie doesn't really feature any monkey hijinks. It features relentless monkey bullying. When we meet the gorilla, all he does is walk into frame, and as punishment for existing, he gets struck by lightning. And then also he eats some lightning, and it bounces around his insides, rupturing all of his vital organs and causing catastrophic, irreparable damage. The character was just introduced, and it's already fucking bullshit. Then he walks up to Oswald with a friendly smile, and the fucker just punches him in the face. So naturally, the gorilla wants revenge, so he chases Oswald and smacks the shit out of him. 
And then, through a series of wacky shenanigans, the gorilla gets shot by a cannonball, and his entire fucking body is eviscerated to nothing more than a skeleton. It's the most fucked up shit I've ever seen. In terms of monkey hijinks, this movie gets one banana out of ten. Number two, monkey performance. This movie is gonna fall into the same trap that King Kung Fu did. You've got a monkey character, but it's not being played by a monkey. I sort of want to give it some leeway here since it's just a cartoon, but they could have at least put in genuine monkey sound effects. Speaking of which, who was the voice actor for the mutated gorilla? Oh, according to Wikipedia, it was... Larry Harvey, the grandfather of Steve Harvey, what the fuck? In terms of monkey performance, I give this one a zero out of 10 bananas. Number three, overall movie quality. This movie is all kinds of fucked up, but let's start with the good. Now I'm not an expert on 1930s animation. But from what I can tell, this stuff is pretty nice. In my opinion, it looks way better than Steamboat Willie, and that only came out four years prior. But again, in the realm of animation quality and expectations by decade, I have no idea what I'm talking about. I'm just trying my best to think of one nice thing to say about this piece of shit cartoon. So they're on a boat, and a duck is smoking a pipe, and then the smoke from the pipe forms two smoke monsters, and they start beating the shit out of each other. And the son is losing his goddamn mind. He has no idea what the fuck is going on. And then the smoke monster starts crying and a storm brews, but I already told you this part earlier. I just really wanted to highlight the sun here. I guess that's the only other part of this cartoon that I actually liked, watching the sun wig the fuck out. Then we get to the gorilla haunted castle part of the cartoon. And let me be the first to say, the gorilla did nothing wrong! He literally didn't do nothing. He's just minding his own business, not hurting anyone, and everything tries to destroy him. The storm that Oswald started tries to kill him with lightning. Oswald punches him in the face for no reason, so he does what anybody would do, an eye for an eye, and he punches Oswald back, and as punishment, he gets completely obliterated. And that's supposed to be the happy ending, the gorilla, who the film portrays as the villain, even though obviously Oswald is the villain, gets murdered. And worst of all, he doesn't even get a name. This is a classic Curly's wife situation. Those of you who read Of Mice and Men know exactly what I'm talking about here. Curly's wife is the only female character in Of Mice and Men. And she's also the only character who doesn't get a name. She doesn't even get the courtesy of being her own character with a name. She's just Curly's wife, nothing more than his property. The book portrays her as the antagonist simply for existing. She dreams of being a movie star, of actually having a voice and being recognized as her own person. And as punishment, she is killed off accidentally suffocated to death by Lenny. And this mutated gorilla is the prototype for Curly's wife. He's the only character without a name. He's villainized simply for existing, and he's murdered for the crime of wanting an equal standing in society. And much like how Curly's wife has become a feminist symbol of the silenced, overlooked woman, I think the mutated gorilla should become a symbol of the intolerant ways monkeys are portrayed in today's society. Monkey acting jobs are constantly stolen by humans. Monkeys are kept in cages to be mocked and guffawed at. Monkey deaths are ridiculed and laughed at by society. It's truly disgusting. And I won't stand for this! Mutated Gorilla, you will not have died in vain! Rise up, my monkey brothers! The time for righteous retribution is now! Oh wait, no. I, I still have one more movie to get through. So, uh, uh l let's get a rain check on the, uh, monkey uprising. In terms of overall movie quality, I give A Wet Night a score of 1 out of 10 bananas giving it a final score of 3 out of 30. 
I've got a pretty good feeling this one is going to sit at the bottom of the list for a long, long time. And now, our final monkey film of the night! Was supposed to be the 1989 romantic comedy Animal Behavior starring Holly Hunter, but evidently this film was so terrible that it no longer exists. Apparently, one of the lead actresses died halfway through filming the movie, and it took them another four years to figure out how to finish it without her. And the final product was so horrible that the director didn't want their name associated with it, so they were credited under a pseudonym. I managed to find the movie trailer online, but the movie itself seems to have been buried. There was no DVD release, and there are zero streamable versions of the film online. I checked Netflix, Amazon, Hulu, Pirate Bay, nobody had it. Meet Mike. He's getting an education in behavior. Armand Asante is teaching him to appreciate music. You just blow up. Karen Allen is teaching him to communicate. Don't you talk back to me. And Holly Hunter is teaching him the value of friendship. Look at that. But when it comes to romance, <laughs> this chip is making a monkey out of everybody. Oh, sorry. Featuring Holly Hunter of Always and Broadcast News, Karen Allen of Starman and Raiders of the Lost Ark, Armand Asante of Private Benjamin, and move over, Bonzo, because here comes Mike, the funniest chimp that ever hit the silver screen. Animal Behavior, a comedy about a lot of love and a little monkey business. Anyway... Let's move on to the actual final film of the night. And the Monkey Box presents us with... Max Mon Amor. Strap in, boys, because this movie, believe you me, is one of the craziest fucking movies I've ever seen. And I'm telling you straight up, it's the best movie of the night. It's unbelievable. It's the kind of shit I didn't know could be made into a movie. So let's get into it. Max Monomore is a French-English-Japanese film from 1986, and no, I'm not kidding. The film was written and directed by Japanese filmmaker Nagisa Oshima, and for some reason it's half in English and half in French. And it's not even like an Inglorious Bastards where some scenes focus on speaking English, and some scenes focus on speaking German, and some scenes focus on speaking French. The characters in this movie interchangeably use English and French from sentence to sentence, for no good reason. But enough about the languages. The real star of the show here is the concept of cuckolding. It's a whole movie about a guy getting cucked. And without explaining anything else, I'm just gonna show you a scene so you know what we're getting into. Margaret, it's me, Peter. Margaret, do you hear me? Open up. Open the door. It's not locked. <laughs> I'm completely fucking serious when I say that might be the greatest scene in film history. It was mankind's destiny ever since the invention of the camera for that scene to be shot on film. I don't know if I've ever laughed harder in my life than when this movie sprung that shit on me and I had no idea it was coming. And for those of you who are confused, the movie is about a woman who is cheating on her husband with a monkey. It's not a wacky misunderstanding, it's not a trick. That's literally the plot of the film and the funniest part of all. And I swear to God this is true. The film is not a comedy. 
This film is 100% a serious drama about a woman who cheats on her husband with a monkey. You gotta believe me, it's not played for laughs. It's a serious fucking relationship drama, which makes it the funniest movie I've ever seen. Number 1. Monkey Hijinks now, before I get down to the nitty-gritty of the monkey hijinks featured in this film, we need to have a lesson in what I like to call cuckolding theory. There's nothing really inherently wrong with being a cuckold. No, no, not that, Maddox, you stupid cuck. Cuckolding, of course, is the sexual fetish wherein a man enjoys watching his wife have sex with another man. And in the modern day, this fetish has taken on some racial connotations. Now, I'm not a racist. So I definitely would not be into this. But for many men, especially white men, the true humiliation from a good old-fashioned cuckolding derives from watching your wife have sex with a man of the... African-American race. Again, I'm not racist, so I definitely don't want to watch my girlfriend fuck a black guy. But for a large portion of the cuckolding community, this horrific racial component is necessary for getting their rocks off. And that brings us back to another horrific racial concept we discussed earlier in this video. Black people being equated with monkeys. So with these two concepts in mind, you tell me, what was the psychology behind a Japanese man writing and directing a film about a woman who cuckolds her husband with a literal monkey? Keep in mind that in 2005, the United Nations literally released a report claiming that Japan is one of the most racist countries on Earth. And Japan essentially replied with, yeah, so what? Anyway, monkey hijinks. A monkey having sex with a woman and cuckolding her husband? Yeah, I'd say that's pretty good. But here's where the movie gets even more crazy. When the husband, Peter, finds out about his wife's affair, he invites the monkey to live with them so it can keep fucking his wife! So, in true monkey hijinks fashion, there's a scene where the family is having a fancy dinner party, and then Max the monkey comes in with some wacky shenanigans. First he beats the shit out of the guest's luggage, and then he tries to fuck Mrs. Jones at the dinner table in front of everybody. Oh yeah, the family's name is Jones, by the way. There's probably a joke in there somewhere, but this movie is already so funny I don't need to make jokes about it. And then we come to one of my favorite examples of monkey hijinks. A monkey has a gun and goes fucking crazy! At one point, Peter tries to shoot and kill Max because he's fed up with being cuckolded, and somehow Max steals the gun and starts running around shooting it. Max! No! Max! Max, lâche le fusil! Max! Non, touche pas ça! Max! Max, what are you doing? Arrête de jouer, hein? Donne-moi ça, donne! Allez, donne! Nelson, get down! Max, no! Oh yeah, and at the end of the movie, Max surfs on top of a moving car. Did I mention that this movie isn't a comedy? In terms of monkey hijinks, I give this one a 7 out of 10 bananas. Number 2. Monkey Performance Now this really fucked with me the whole time I was watching the movie. Because truth be told, I could not tell if it was a real monkey or not. It is so authentic, and it looks so real. And that's why I assumed it had to be fake. Because it would have been incredibly hard to train a monkey to do all this shit. So let's play a game. I'll show you a clip from the movie. And I want you to guess if the monkey is real or fake. Yeah. <laughs> Max. <laughs> According to Wikipedia, the role of Max was played by Ailsa Burke, but apparently she wasn't credited for the role. So I don't know if that means they were trying to pretend it wasn't a human in a costume or what. 
But I've got to say, the fact that I literally couldn't tell speaks wonders to both the costume and the performance. Plus, they used actual monkey sound effects unlike the other two films. So even though it wasn't a real monkey, I still have to give it a few points in this category just for being so impressive. In terms of monkey performance, I give this one a 2 out of 10 bananas. Number 3. Overall Movie Quality it shouldn't be a secret at this point. I really enjoyed this film. There's something about its presentation that I find fascinating. They took a completely absurd concept and played it as straight as they possibly could. The characters are grappling with this conundrum in real ways, actually pondering the philosophy behind letting your wife fuck a monkey. But is a love affair possible? Like the one that you described between the young girl and the horse. Could you conceive of such a thing with a monkey? I I'm not talking about sex, or even the, the affection you can feel for a dog. I'm talking about love. Is love possible only between members of the same species? And the serious nature of the film makes it funnier than the comedy version of this movie ever could have been. Do you think that you could have sex with a monkey? Well, why do you ask? I'd like to know. You women have so many secrets. You want to watch me have sex with a monkey? Mm, I didn't say that. I've really gotta hand it to these actors. Mr. and Mrs. Jones were so good in these roles that it actually forced me to take the movie seriously. And then of course, Ailsa Burke brought Max the chimpanzee to life. The story was constantly engaging, perhaps just because the absurdity of the premise was inherently interesting to me. And then the ending of the film is maybe the most bizarre thing of it all. It's like those pet movies where the dad hates the pet, but the family loves the pet. And then by the end, the dad learns to love the pet and they live happily ever after. But in this case, it's a man learning to love the monkey that fucks his wife. And then it ends with a gravely serious conversation about how Mrs. Jones loves Max so much that if animal control tried to take him away, she would take a gun and kill him. And then it just fucking ends! Of all the movies I discussed tonight, this is probably the one I think you should watch. You've really gotta see it to believe it. It was movies like this and King Kung Fu that made me glad I'm doing this new series. Because if not for the monkey box, I would never would have heard of these movies. And I definitely would have never watched them. In terms of overall movie quality, I give Max Monomore a score of 8 out of 10 bananas, giving it a final score of 17 out of 30. If only it would have used a real monkey, then it could have gotten a much higher score. But for the time being, it's the number one ranked monkey movie on the list. And that's all for today, folks. Three monkey movies down, thousands to go. I'll see you next time with another installment of Remem. Ranking every monkey movie ever made!